Is the Lord among us or not? That's the title for the sermon today, but first, pray with me. God of glory and power, king of the nations and ruler of all, you are the great physician and healer, the source of all life and health. Send your love and spirit to your world to heal and cleanse it of all diseases. May the nations work together to combat and contain the current pandemic. May your church be confident in your sovereignty and faithfulness, bold in its prayers and ministries of healing, a comfort for those who have lost loved ones, and a place of safety for those experiencing prejudice. Grant these things through the power of your holy name, O Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to whom be all glory and honor, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Well, it, it seems that a crisis brings out interesting and disturbing ways of coping. Now, I already knew that I became a compulsive cleaner, especially of dirt that I find on the floor. Naturally, I'm expecting some of you to raise your hand and offer your homes for me to work out my compulsions, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but, I'm sorry, I don't get compulsive about other people's dirt. Yours just doesn't bother me. <laughs> But the new thing that I discovered was how hard it is to stop eating popcorn. Skinny Pop in particular was my comfort food this week, especially as I was feeling the tensions of making decisions for this congregation here. For viewers on live stream, you need to know that I'm not the rector. I'm the associate. And while fa why Father Peter had to buy plane tickets two months ago for this week, I will never understand. <laughs> he didn't know. <laughs> All kidding aside, though, I think this week has helped me identify with our guy Moses from Exodus chapter 17. This is on page 59 in your blue Bibles, and I encourage you to turn there. Exodus chapter 17. We will focus our thoughts on the heartfelt cry of verse 7, is the Lord among us or not? Somehow that question has particular poignancy as we wrestle with our own fears and questions about the future. Lord, are you among us? And the central image of that question is the physical situation that the Israelites were in, which is the wilderness. Brutal, foreboding, and arid, the wilderness is not a place of comfort after those many years of slavery to the Egyptians. They were a people, a community, who were stuck between a promise and its fulfillment. See, they had had the most dramatic rescue ever. They had passed through the Red Sea on dry ground, only to see the Egyptian army being wiped out by that same sea. They had been full of hope and expectation. They had no reason to ask, is the Lord among us or not? The answer was obvious, and they had seen it with their own eyes. But then it turned into a crucible that revealed their sinful hearts. Doesn't that sound familiar? Can we relate to crucible-like testing that's being foisted upon us? Now, this was not their first issue with drinkable water. Just two chapters earlier in chapter 15, verse 23, right after the Exodus, they were in the wilderness of Shur, and they went for three days without water. They came to a place called Mara, but that water was bitter. So naturally the people complained, I would too, as would you. Poor Moses took his complaints to the Lord, who instructed him 
to throw a piece of wood into that water to make it drinkable. And the Lord gave them this warning to follow him closely. And then he led them to the most wonderful oasis full of 12 springs and 70 palm trees. I can just picture them resting in the shade under those trees as they recognized that the wilderness is not a God forsaken place after all. The wilderness is not God forsaken. Now remember that in the days ahead when we are tempted to complain about our own society, societal wilderness. On the contrary, God is very much present and leading the way by meeting needs. Their needs were manna and quail. Our needs are his presence and that we might know that this is not God forsakenness. And notice that God leads but does not coerce so that even as they journey on to the wilderness of Zin, they have already forgotten about the source of their water. Instead, quarreling, complaining sets in. And it's so prominent a theme that Moses names the places Massah and Meribah, which means testing and quarreling. You can see verse 7 for that. And the Israelites had shifted to accusations directed to Moses. This is in verse 3. But the people thirsted and they grumbled against Moses saying, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us, our kids, the livestock with thirst? See, the crucible of the wilderness revealed the impurities of their hearts because they really shifted so easily to accusation. The heat revealed how forgetful they were. Now, sure, it's easy for us from a distance, from this distant vantage point, to see those accusations. Moses surely did not bring them up out of Egypt only to kill their children and their livestock. That's ridiculous. But that's what the human heart does. That's the sin in our heart, lashing out at others who actually care for them care for us, accusing them of ridiculous motives. Their foolish hearts were darkened, as our Romans chapter 1 reading told us. But that's what the crucible of the wilderness reveals, our foolish, darkened hearts. Now let's read the whole passage as a chunk now. It's not long. All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of Zen by stages, according to the commandment of the Lord, and they camped at Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink, and therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us, our children, and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And then the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with it which you struck the Nile, and go. And behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come up out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the name of that place Massah and Meribah, because of the quarreling of the people of Israel, and because they tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us or not? Our final focus this morning comes from verse 6. How is it that God can give this gift of water where only rocks abound? How is this possible? For that, we look to Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 10, verse 7. So 1 Corinthians 10, verse... Oh, did I say 7? I... It says four right here clearly in front of me. It's, on, it's in verse four. 
and I've mashed several verses together. Our fathers all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was Christ. So here is Paul reflecting on our same passage here from Exodus, and he has some insight to share. Now, he does not think that a material rock followed the wilderness generation, nor was he thinking of a movable well. Instead, Paul understood that the divine source of water journeyed with them. Paul understood that rock has always been a metaphor for God's stability, God's permanence. Paul knows that this miraculous provision is a gift, is a part of God's saving work. The Israelites needed saving from the Egyptians, and they needed to be saved from their thirst in the wilderness. And Paul knows that Jesus is the source of every spiritual gift. Some have thought that Paul is telling us that a pre-existent Christ manifested himself to the people in the wilderness. That is one possible interpretation. So it could be, but it also might not be what Paul is getting at. What we do see in verse 6 is that God's presence was there. God said that he would stand before Moses and produce the gift of water that would save his people. Here is the rescue. Here is salvation. Here is the critical thing that people need in the wilderness, and it is being provided as a gift to them. Just like grace is a gift. Water is a gift. The wilderness is not God forsaken, but it is a crucible that reveals our stubborn hearts. I would like to finish with words that Moses could have told his own people, but they are true for us as well. Prepare for trouble because the days ahead are not going to be easy. On the night before Jesus faced the ultimate tragedy, and you could even say victory, on Golgotha and the cross, none of his disciples had any real idea of what was coming in the days and years ahead, or at least not that we know of. Tradition says that nearly all original apostles died as martyrs. So even as Jesus spoke these words of comfort, he made clear that his friends would suffer. In the world, you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Is the Lord among us or not? That's the question that we are tempted to ask. See, the trouble and the anxieties pressing in on our hearts will challenge us to question, to complain, question God's goodness. Resist that question and trust God instead. Secondly, pray. We have been summoned to intercede on behalf of people facing severe challenges. We can pray for people. We should, we must pray. And I've thought about this challenge that I'm planning to take. That each time that I read another news source, and let me tell you, there's a lot of reading out there, right? That by at the end of that reading, that we would pray. Pray for people as individuals that we know who are facing serious situations or as a community of people and countries. This is a call to prayer and that's what we do. We Christians, we pray. And finally, do not be afraid. We have been rescued from the fear of death itself, from the kinds of fears that gripped those Israelites in the wilderness. It gripped the woman at the well too. And having been rescued, there is truly nothing that can separate us from the love of God. We know this. 
So we might feel abandoned as those Israelites felt, abandoned. They felt helpless, but we draw on our faith to counter that feeling. Is the Lord among us or not? Indeed, the Lord is among the people he loves so very much. God even puts up with our grumbling, our complaining, our cries for help in a true crisis. We might be put to the test in the next couple of weeks, but I encourage you to accept his gift of water, to accept his gift of grace. May it be, Lord Jesus. Amen.